Welcome to episode five. If you're in Turkey, episode Besh. If you're in Ireland, episode Kui. And I could go on all day. I think as a strength coach, ladies and gentlemen, you lean, learn to need to know how to say five in a dozen languages, and that's all you'll ever need to know. For about 20 years, I have known what I wanted on a website, but I have never really been able to explain or even, I don't even know if the technology was there. So when I look at workouts, the very first thing I ask is, what equipment do you have? That's where I start, equipment. I'm, I'm, I'm not Harry Potter. I can't flick a wand and all of a sudden an Olympic bar shows up. So I always start mentally with equipment first. And then from there, we can talk about, well, how much time do you got to work out? How proficient are you? And then, and then comes the real kind of art is I put this workout out to you and then you say, you know, I can't do this exercise. Well, when you say I can't do this exercise, now we have six or seven emails. Wouldn't it be a lot better if you had a button to press? So at danjohnworkouts.com, in one of the member sections, we have an area called settings. So let's just go to settings and see what I'm talking about. Let's click on settings. What I suggest you do first is always go to the park bench workout. So I'm at park bench workout right now. I click the button. Uh, a park bench workout is a repeatable, doable workout that you think you can do over and over and over again. Let's just for, for fun, let's pick, let's pick, let's make it an easy workout. Let's pick 30 minutes, okay? There's only two options, 30 minutes and 60 minutes. Somebody asked me, well, don't, why don't you have 45? And I'm like, because, I don't know why. Because just go heavier and it'll, make, it'll take longer. Uh, let's just do a, a, the basic standard three days a week because that's where most people come in at. Um, there's a question we have in the next one. Uh, what's your current fitness level? Well, are you just getting started? You work out occasionally or you exercise regularly? Let's just say uh, you're about, let's go with four because four, you know, four is where most people have some idea what things are going on. So let's pick four. And now, uh, we have two more options, increase fitness level by automatically increasing difficulty or maintaining the challenge. For this one, let's go with automatically getting harder, but you won't really see it on this example. And then comes what I think is the brilliant part. What equipment do you have? Do you have a suspension trainer? Um, let's just say in this example, you do, okay? Do you have a barbell? Uh, no, you don't. Cable call machine? No, I don't. Dumbbell? No, sorry. Exercise ball, no. What's an exercise band? Oh, obviously, no. Uh, exercise bench, okay. Uh, no, I don't have one. Foam roller, go and buy one. There's, they're, they're practically nothing that even the department stores have now. So let's say yes on foam roller. Uh, let's let's take kettlebell. Let's You've got one kettlebell, nothing wrong with that. Uh, lat pull-down machine, usually you don't. Pull-up bar, most home trainers don't at first. Sliders are these wonderful little thing that <laughs> you move. Whoever figured this out was great. It's how you move furn heavy furniture around a room without ruining the floor. But let's just say you don't have one and you don't have a squat rack. Here's how fancy it is. Right at the bottom it says, build workouts. You press the button and boom. Now I've got workouts for the week. I've got workout one, workout two, and workout three. So let's just look at workout one. And it says 10 minutes of walking. Hmm, that's not, that's not, that's too easy for me. I want to progress up. So right there on the right, there's an up button, very scientific. And we're going to press the up button and it says basic linear warm up. Huh, I don't know what that is. That's fine. When you press basic linear warm up, a box comes up and it shows you everything you need to do. Let's slide down to something that's a little simpler, okay? Um, it says there, heel lift air squat. Well, let's go down. That's too, I don't know what that is. That's too comp. Let's go down something simpler. Well, let's go, we got TRX squat. Hmm, not bad. The S variation. Now let's just do the two ups, heel lift, and now one more up. And we got air squat. That's still too easy. Don't you know who I am? Let's go up one more time. Kettlebell gobble squat, which is pretty good for a beginner. And let's go up, up again. TRX jump squat. Well, let's try one more time. Up one more time and we see jump squat. So right there, this is 
this is when this is the thing that amazes me. You are now inside of the way I see things. Whenever I say an exercise like we're going to do squats or hinges, one of the things I want you to know is that there's progressions and regressions of every exercise. By having this right there for you, you can progress up to a more, I hate to call them complex, but a, a little bit higher level of exercise or, well, that's just too tough for me where I'm at right now and you can regress down. You are now right inside my brain. This is how I see the world. Um, I'm very pleased with the way this worked out. I'm very happy with the whole with the whole website, but that particular thing, this little park bench workout generator, it to me is the genius. And this thanks to Brian for all the work he did on this, because this is the way my brain works, and he was able to put it right in front of you right now. Um, as we slide down to the next workout, workout two, uh, we have TRX split squat. Uh, that's too easy for me. I'm going to slide up to wall split so squat. Great. Elevated push-up. I can't do an elevated push-up. I'll go down, and we got wall push-ups. Uh, I would look at this and say workout two is a little easier, and now we slide to workout three. I, I like the linear workout, but today I just feel like going for a walk, and we have basically some of the same options. When you Mark complete, next week you get a whole new set of workouts and they just build from there. To me, that's a miracle. Well, folks, we got a question from Dung Nguyen Van. Hi, Dan, I have two questions uh, I wanna ask you. How, what percent of rep maximum for optimal strength increase? Well, I, I tell you one thing, that question by itself is one of the, <laughs> one of the most difficult things by itself to wrap your arms on. What weight should I be using to get stronger? Now, I believe in the easy strength protocol because it works so well for me and everyone has tried. And really what we found that there's a range about 70 to 80% that seems to work the best. Now, if you read my work, if you read like uh, the easy strength supplements in the members area, you'll find out that I'm a believer in what John Powell taught me about the discus throw. Let's say you throw the discus 200 feet. Well, if you throw 200, your 80% is 160. Now, once you throw 200, trying to get to 201 means you've got to pull your maximum up higher. You got to really pull. You just threw your lifetime best, and now your people are asking you, when are you going to add to it? John's idea is this. Instead of trying to pull and grind that 201 up higher, what I'm going to ask you to do is a discus thrower, shot putter, and lifter is we're going to put 80% on the bar. And I want you to get a sense of how easy you can do it. In the discus, you know, when I was throwing in my lifetime best, throwing 160 in training was actually hard to do because I couldn't figure out the rhythm and tempo. So if you told me to throw 160, I'd throw 170. And your job as a coach is say, ease on down a little bit. So now I found we put a bucket out at 160 and I'm trying to throw the discus in the bucket. Okay, a little target practice. That's a wonderful way to learn to throw farther. And all of a sudden I know that I am just dropping 170 every time at the effort I used to throw 160. Powell's insight was this. We have nudged our 80% up. We've nudged it up. And we can guess that on the other side, our 100% has gone up. Now, I know it works in throwing, but then I discovered it also works in the weight room. When I was young, I read a great article about how the Cubans, the Cuban Olympic lifting team, had done this fascinating thing. They spent a lot of time with 80% in singles. Uh, they were also one of the first Olympic lifting teams to really think, so you do a lift, you're working out today and your coach goes, you know, you seem weak here. And then they would add a, add a bodybuilding movement to it or make up an exercise that day to fix it. It's interesting because we now call it the conjugate method uh, Bondarchuk uses it with hammer throwers, but really the first time I'd heard about it was with the Cuban lifters. And the idea about doing 80% is that you never miss and you grease that groove. You tell the nervous system, this is what I want. And then over time, you nudge your strength levels up. I think for someone who doesn't do drugs, that pushing that 70 and 80% area over time and give yourself time is the best place for your uh, rep maximums to be. 
And then, of course, the follow-up question, and thank you for this one, too. What tempo is optimal lifting for strength? <laughs> Make the lift is the optimal. I've, I have never heard a good lifter talk about tempo. I know on the bodybuilding sites, and I know that, you know, these these people talk about it. I think it's nonsense. I've, and I've always thought that. You know, I can remember, you know, when I, back when I was benching over 400 pounds, there's no way I would go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. <gasps> Pause. 1,001, 1,002. There's no way. Because that weight can literally kill me if I miss it. When you're Olympic lifting, you want to make the lift. So I don't believe in tempo at all. I believe that you make the lift. You make the lift. Let me repeat that one more time. Make the lift. Good questions. Thank you. I got a question from Jay. And Jay says, is it okay to train your squat at a heavier weight than your deadlift? I'm 40 years old and my current workout plan is a combination of 5x5 five five barbell, hard style kettlebell, calisthenics, and some loaded carries. Uh, and that's because you're 40, okay? Uh, when you get a little older, you're, you're going to have to, you know, simplify that down. A couple of years ago, I had a serious medical issue that required major abdominal surgery. I'm fine now. Remember, I don't give medical advice. After having to take it easy for the better part of a year to recover from my medical injuries and surgery, I developed a bulging disc in my lower back. That's resolved. Boy, you sound like me. But I've literally had to start from scratch. I can back squat and front squat with the barbell with no problems. However, barbell deadlifts with a traditional stance begin to uh, aggravate my back. So for my hinge movements, I've been doing lighter, higher rep, sumo stance deadlift, single leg deadlift, kettlebell swings. He asked, he asked the question, do you think long term that this will lead to muscular imbalances? No, no, I don't. Of course not. In fact, one of the interesting things about the deadlift, and again, I hate to keep doing this, but if you go to the members area and you read the easy strength stuff, I include an article about increasing your deadlift by not deadlifting, which is kind of a fascinating thing. There are people who believe that doing like three sets of 20 with light deadlifts is just as good as doing heavy loaded deadlifts. When I first heard that, I went, oh, that doesn't, but then I thought about reps. So doing high rep deadlifts, as long as you're in a safe position, you have the courage to maintain it, um, and you stop well below your blow up, I think will help the hinge as much as anything. Of course, you know, the kettlebell swing, if you believe in physics, of course, that would mean if you're an American, you have to believe in science, which as I read, not many do anymore, but Force equals mass times acceleration. So if you're doing kettlebell swings and you're really focusing on the acceleration, well, it could, if, according to physics, match heavy deadlifts. So it's going to be one of those things. Now, the only thing I can say with an injured back, how fast do you want to roll, you want to hit things? And with, the, with an injured back, how heavy do you want to think, do things? So as much as I hate to give medium advice, you might have to find that middle place. That's why I recommend with the uh, military guys I work with, the rack deadlift. Because the rack deadlift, so you get a rack, you put the barbell either one inch below your knee or one inch above your knee, and you do deadlifts. The nice thing about it, we start that program off with sets of 25, which is enormously high reps for the deadlift movement. But since you're in the rack, you're in a hinge position. This is your butt, here's your chin. You're in a hinge position the whole time. And that seems, if you keep the integrity of the hinge position, it is a neutral back position, uh, slide arch here, um, slide arch in the neck, neutral, and you're just doing um, you're basically doing slow kettlebell swings. I would like to add something you don't have there, but I don't know why you don't have hip thrusts uh, as part of your training protocol because I think the Brett Contreras hip thrust, and I would use bands if I were you, uh, bands around your waist uh, and, of course, and then a glute band around your knees. You're going to push your knees out the whole time. Um, that might be the answer to a lot of your pr problems because – There'll be no load on your spinal column. 
you'll have bands, but no load. And your glutes have to do all the work. It's just an idea, but I'd like you to think about it. Um, one other thing I got to thank you, uh, Jay mentions in his thing about how much he likes reading the book, Never Let Go, and the audio approaches to some, uh, the audio versions of some of my books. And thank you. Um, as you may or may not know, I have a huge debt to the coaches in my life. And it's, it makes me happy to think that, you know, the, the things that I've learned and shared have an impact on your life. So I appreciate that, Jay. Okay. My friend David Berta uh, writes us, what time of you did you or do you continue to program Litvinov's? Uh, for those of you who don't know, a Litvinov is an exercise name that I wish I could change. Um, but basically, it's a hinge or a squat followed by a sprint or a sled pull. So you would do uh, overhead squats and let go of the bar and sprint away. Front squats, dump the bar, sprint away. Uh, deadlift, this is an interesting one, never worked as well as I hoped. Deadlift, uh, then and run with a sled away. Uh, that one never actually worked as well as it looked. Um, I mentioned, he, he says, you mentioned, Dan has mentioned over and over how it was a game changer in my career, which it was. Now he's asking, where do you fit them in? Uh, when I was doing Highland games and discus throwing, the Litvinovs became, um, I would say up to two times a week going into the middle part of the season and towards the end, it became almost what I did for lit weightlifting. The Litvinovs were my weightlifting program, uh, squat followed by sprint. Um, well, th this was a failure, but, um, snatch followed by sprint it, that didn't work out as well nowadays with more kettlebells i do bulgarian goat back swings toss it and run gobble squat toss and run um if i'd have had more uh, a better arrangement of, of kettlebells back then i would have done goblet squats followed by sled pulls quite a bit towards the end of the season that would be my training because in a one-stop shop i get my hinge I get my squat, I get my sprint, I get my sled. Um, and the one caveat I always throw in, if you're doing more than t three total reps of that, squat, sprint, squat, sprint, squat, sprint, and you want to do more, you're, either your load is too light, your sprint isn't long enough, or, and this is the big one, your intensity wasn't there. Um, now I use the Litvinov in a very interesting way. I use it for conditioning. Now, it's a little different now, but I do, well, there's, let me give you a good example. Um, goblet squat, followed by prowler, followed by push-up. <sighs> goblet squat, prowler, push-up. <sighs> goblet squat, prowler, push-up. You know, you can have up to a minute rest in between or whatever. But one of the things you might miss, and many people do when I go over that, um, goblet squats up and down. Prowler is linear, push-ups are on the floor, the levels change in all three of those. And I think the level changing hits that heart as much as all the other nonsense that we do. David, that's that's a good question. I hope I answered it fully. You know, Connor asks, Connor asks an interesting question because of the way what he asks. Hi, Dan. Was wondering your take on farmer walks as far as being a longevity lift. I'm going to stop you right there because that's interesting. The rack deadlift, as we understand it now, and it actually it's similar to Brett Contreras' deficit deadlift, used to be called something called the health lift. So the second I read that, I'm like, yeah, I like where this guy's head at. It's, is this the farmer walk a health lift? Now, I do think right there, this, before we even get into the question itself, I'm 62 and I'm still the guy who gets called up to move couches. I'm still the guy who you call up when you're moving. And I think, now I'm 62, and I think it's because farmer walks, they work your grip strength, they work your posture, and they work your work capacity. Now, posture, grip strength, work capacity, we know that grip strength is related to longevity. Uh, you can tell by looking at somebody sometimes at how old they are, and then work capacity is what keeps you around. That's a three for three to me on longevity. But now let's read the question. I am mid-20s. God bless you, I tell you. 
mid twenties. It reminds mid twenties. When was I? Okay. But already trying to think long term. Thank you. Wear your seatbelt. Don't smoke. Floss your teeth. Go to the dentist two, three times a year. Get a medical doctor about your age and go to him as often as you can. Uh, sleep soundly. You know the basics. That's the biggest thing. Start now with good, uh, good habits. I, uh, he also does jujitsu. I am also just generally burnt out from all the other patterns of movement, yet love the effect I feel from carries. I was a little older when I did this, but you're a wise young man, Connor. Uh, I remember after I hit 500 squat, I realized I could care less. I wish I'd have never done more than 400. Now I'm starting to think I wish that was even too heavy. Realistically, could you look at this as one big movement to model everything else? Uh, would there be any drawbacks in terms of mobility and movement? Huge fan. Thank you. Um, one thing I would argue, not even disagree with you, but just add, why don't you do, make sure you do some goblet squats, uh, maybe that easy progression where you go from goblet squat to overhead squat to maintain the squatting movement and then probably throw in some hangs or pull-ups and some presses and in a weekly format somehow. But I, I like where your head's at. My only concern is you still do want to do some upper body work in, in this in this kind of plane. And I think you want to do some kind of hinge and squat. But hey, man, if you're a little burnt out, take farmer walks seriously. Take loaded carriers seriously. And let's find out what happens. I know this. You know, I've been lifting weights since 1965. That's a lot of work, weeks of working out. A lot of weeks of working out. If I decide to say for four weeks I'm going to do this or that, I can come, I've got plenty of time to, you know, to reflect on it and fill in the gaps that I haven't been doing. The biggest issue I see when I work with most people is the gaps. Here are the five basics, push, pull, hinge, squat, load of carry. Most people never do loaded carries. Most people never squat appropriately. Just by doing goblet squats and loaded carries, I can change most people's uh, careers. So I find your question fascinating and thank you for sharing that. That's these are actually good questions that you're scaring me, people. Thank you. Ah, bless this guy. This guy's from this guy is Zach. Two questions from a collegiate strength coach, father of two girls, two year old and six month man. You are just like me, husband to a beautiful and loving wife. And if she's the wife of a strength coach, she has patience beyond all patience. How heavy is too heavy for kettlebell swings? Is there any value in progressing to a 200-pound kettlebell? I would just say this. Physics, force equals mass times uh, acceleration. Uh, if you're not accelerating it, you're just spinning your wheels. Um, I know I can get a lot out of the 48-kilo bell, the 106. I don't want to say no here, but I think the th issue would be in the grip strength. Once you start really hitting that 200-pound bell, Will will your grip strength give out before everything else does? And let me just add one other thing, you know, as I think out loud. If something goes wrong with a 200 kettlebell bell, it goes wrong hard and fast. So think about that. He has some thoughts on a microdosing a collegiate basketball team uh, by using a warm-up practice time as a quick grease-the-groove workout. You know, and then he follows up, or is that just a fancy way of saying, is this easy strength? And I think yes. But you have the squat in there. Uh, be sure you read the easy strength supplements on the site because it basically easy strength now, in my mind, is swings work, vertical push, vertical pull, a deadlift variation. With college guys, it's got to be a rack. Uh, college, it's got to be a rack deadlift. And some kind of thing like the ab wheel. <laughs> And there's this wonderful little note here at the end. Side note, my two-year-old peed on my copy of Can You Go? <sighs> you know, somewhere in the universe, everyone is smiling because that is the funniest thing I've read in a long time. Your child peed on Can You Go? Well, of course she can go. She just did. Great question. Um, we have a question here. Uh, we have a, a man whose son uh, is a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Well, good for you. Uh, they carry excessive weights. I work with a lot of military units. Um, I have a program for them. I don't want to read all this because the question goes away from what I what I know. Um, 
And if it's okay with uh, my friend Brian, what we'll do this week was we'll post the what I call the post-deployment plan. Um, it's a very simple three-month uh, matrix of workouts. We'll give you all the information. We'll put it in the uh, members only area because you kind of have to do that um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there that you know. It's, um, let's just say that. Let's as soon as this uh, as soon as I finish this, we'll we'll load up the post deployment plan and you can use that. And it basically has everything else that you're asking here. Okay, thank you. Question number two: um, Loaded carries. How heavy should you go? Well. Loaded carries. Here's the rule with loaded carries. Every workout should be different and unique. You ask about using 224 kilo kettlebells, and I love the idea that you're varying from kettlebell here to here. One thing, never do double overhead kettlebell carries. You can do crosswalks, one hand in the suitcase carry, one hand overhead. But um, if you have the equipment to do it, um, yeah, you can go as heavy as you want. Uh, I've done double body weight kettlebell carries for a fairly long way, uh, and it is eye-opening how freakishly sore it feels like you had an Olympic lifting meet the day before. Um, uh, since we use a trap bar with those heavy ones, the deadlift is really nothing, so it's really quite easy to, uh, to pick up. But just remember, you can go really, really heavy on loaded carries. You can go really, really, really far on loaded carries. Once every couple of months, you can go really heavy, really far. But most of the time, try to do some kind of uh, swing between those two opposites, okay? And uh, Dan, Larry, I got to thank you because that allows me to add more content to the site. So good question. I appreciate it. All right. Next question comes from Taylor. Hi, Dan. Thanks for starting this podcast. It's been excellent so far. Well, this puts a lot of pressure on me. Boy, now, so you worried about it just going that way. My question is about strength training uh, for pregnancy. Um, as kindly as I can say this, uh, Taylor, strength training has almost no effect on pregnancy. Um, I had a class in about the fifth grade, and they explained how pregnancy happens. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the way I train push, pull, hinge, squat, or loaded carry. Well, actually, the hinge probably helps a little bit. Okay, that was an attempt at humor. Are there particular exercises you recommend prior to an expected pregnancy? That's, now that's a good question, as well as during and after pregnancy. Okay, I can't give you any advice about during pregnancy. And after pregnancy, I would like you to make sure it's all cleared with um, you know, your practitioner. Before getting pregnant, I would suggest uh, that the female uh, – that the female build up some work capacity because what's going to happen during the 40 weeks of pregnancy is there's going to be a lot of, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of additional load as we go through. So that's why I've always thought that loaded carries, um, learning how to squat again, learning how to hinge again, Bulgarian goat bag swings with the weight on the belly might actually be an interesting practice. I I'm going to, tone down my my answers here because i i do have concerns uh about the fragility of life during pregnancy and i don't want anything i say to be misconstrued and add to it. you you ask how should intensity and volume change before during after mm, it, i gotta tell you and i know there's a guy in australia who wants to punch me in the face because i say it depends but i can't even imagine an it depends answer more important than this I don't like to talk about it, but, you know, my daughter, Lindsay, and my wife nearly died um, at childbirth. And it's just too fragile for, for you to ask the opinion of a strength coach. It's just, it's just too fragile. But I, I appreciate the question. And, and maybe we can find a fine female to a strength coach who's had children to help you on that. Um, uh, Sarah Smith, for example, is someone I have great regard for, and I'll do my best to uh, contact her and see if I can help you there. Um, thank you. That's Those are good questions, okay, that I can't answer. We have a question from Samuel from Denmark. Now, here's the cool thing. I'll be there in about two or three weeks. Uh, I'll be in Odensee, Samuel, so maybe I can see you there. Um, 
I find the 10,000 swing challenge quite fascinating, but I've yet to hear you talk about how do you know if you're ready for it? From my heart, I'm going to tell you, you don't. Uh, the first time we did it, <laughs> I got an email from TC Loma, who's uh, the, the, the publisher and editor of T Nation. He said, we want you to do an article about the 10,000 swing challenge. And I said, I emailed back and I go, well, what is that? And he said, well, 10,000 swings. The next day, Mike Brown and I went in the weight room, picked up 24 kilo bells and swang a thousand times. Day after we swang 800 and said, we need to think this through. So, so when I was ready for it was I got an email. Uh, but there's some more to this question. And I like where you're heading here. After attempting it a few more times on your older training templates, uh, so he tried the original style of doing a set of 10, three pull-ups, a set of 15, two pull-ups, a set of 25, one pull-up, and a set of 50. Um, that worked for me. Big engine guys with big grips can do 50 swings with the 24K. We quickly discovered as we moved on to the next group that that was a rarity, and we, we, we agreed on only two, uh, basically, let's just give it to you right here. 15 swings followed by 35 or a set of 10, a set of, a set of 10, a set of 15, a set of 25, which adds up to 50 reps and you spin that through 10 times. Uh, if you, if you go to the members only site, uh, you will find, um, the new templates for these workouts that add that in the, all the human body movements. I noticed some grip, grip, issues around a 300 to four rep range. And I know what you're talking about, this cramp that you get right here. Um, you might, if you're trying to do 50, you get to 22. If you're trying to do 25, you get to 17. I, I get that. You need more rest in that 300 to 400 rep range. You just do. It's a lot of work. Hence the question, how do you rec recommend preparing for the challenge? Since it's a challenge, there is no prep. Uh, it's not a certification. It's not a contest. It's just something you do. By the way, I'm fine if it takes you an hour, an hour and a half to do the 500 reps. When I see people online posting that I did this in 22 minutes, my first thought is, here's one thing I know you did. Well, <laughs> you did not do kettlebell swings. Um, keep up the great work and please come back to Denmark in the future. Again, I'll be there in three weeks. Go to Oli's st site, Strong for Life. Strong for Life. As I was unable to attend your workshop with Oli and the gang this time. Oh, okay. Misunderstood. Keep up the good work and let Brian know he's doing an excellent job with the website. Well, I will let Brian know he's doing an excellent job with the website. I will I will let him know because I think he's fabulous. You know, uh, and, and if you don't mind me on this question, um, Sam, is that sometimes when it comes to things like challenges, it's a challenge. And it might just be awful. But part of the challenge is the awfulness of it. Um, so sometimes there is no prep. It's like, it's almost like you wake up and there's a baby on the, uh, on, on, in front of your house and you have to raise a child or <laughs> the, even the old fashioned way of having the 40 weeks, you think you're ready for a kid until that, those little eyes stare at you the first time, okay. you know, Sam, as much as I love the challenge, you also have to ask yourself, why am I doing it? Uh, we discovered through a lot of trial and error at first, we thought that 250 was the repeatable, doable number in kettlebell swings. But then all of a sudden, we just broke. Now we're more in that 75 to 125 a day for the rest of your life. So if you're thinking that 75 to, two, uh, to 125, 150 or is that wiggle room for repeatable and doable, 75, 125, 150, kind of depends on how you swing. If you double those numbers, it kind of gives you some insights. Like if you feel good, I mean, you feel like you could do 150 swings a day for the rest of your life, do a one month challenge of 300 swings a day and just see what it goes. There's no need for you to do the 10,000 swings challenge. There's no, there's no need. And I apologize sometimes because I'll write an article for a specific audience and reason. And yet what happens is, is it, it gets kind of muddled. 
when it comes down to everybody else and everybody else's needs. Um, I used to take on any challenge the world would uh, offer and it ended up, you know, kind of beating me down a little bit. So I just don't want you to be in that situation time. All right. Thanks for a good question, Sam. Remember, folks, um, this podcast, and if you want questions, please remember, podcast at danjohnworkouts.com for the questions. This podcast is driven by your questions. I thought this week's questions were very good. Uh, each and every week, I'm here to answer your questions. Keep sending them in. I love you. Talk to you soon.